today I'll be talking about some new things I've been working on in Janus, and specifically bandwidth estimation, which is kind of a big mystery in WebRTC that I'll try to demystify a bit if I can. And um, I'm, uh, I'm Lorenzo Minero. I'm from, from Naples in the south of Italy. I got my PhD at the university there, and with some colleagues, I co-founded a small company called Miteco. I'm the main order of Janus. That's what I do uh, all days mostly. And th those are a few links uh, that you can refer to if you want to learn a bit more about me, including some ugly music that I, have, that I like to write. And this picture comes from one of the ComCon editions. If you don't know what ComCon is, it's a really cool event that happens in the UK every year. Find Dan Jenkins around and he'll tell you about it. It's going to happen soon again. It's really an event that I recommend. And uh, my company is a small company that was started as an academic spin-off because we all got our PhDs there. We, we worked a lot with real-time multimedia from a standard perspective, do the usual things, and our office is somewhere over here. So definitely not a bad place to be, as you can see. It's, it's quite sunny and quite, and quite nice. But coming to the actual topic, so what is bandwidth estimation? Because it can, uh, it can be a bit confusing in its definition itself. And in general, it's a matter of uh, figuring out how much you can send within a so-called unit of time. For instance, within a second, how much data you can send, because of course you don't want to send more than you can send because maybe you have local constraints or no more than the network itself can accommodate because there may be some uh, bottlenecks somewhere in the network or more than the receiver on the other side can receive. So you definitely don't want any of those things, which is why bandwidth estimation is useful. It's important not to confuse it with congestion control. They sometimes work together, but they are not the same thing because Bandwidth estimation is the estimation of how much you can send, and then congestion control is what kicks in in order to avoid leading uh, to congestion and avoid issues like packets going, getting someplace too late or not going there at all. And of course, it's important to do those things because otherwise you, you can incur in congestion, you can incur in failures and stuff like this. And it is doubly important for WebRTC because in general, whenever you are doing, for instance, uh, you are downloading a file or uploading a file, you really don't care about delays. The same amount of data may take more or less depending on how much bandwidth you have available. It doesn't really matter. You slow or speed up uh, depending on the congestion window. With WebRTC, you really don't have the same luxury. So everything is real time. Anything that gets there one second later is too late and is useless, which means that typically you do need to adapt the data itself that you are sending in order to avoid congestion and try to fit in whatever you in the channel that you have available somehow, somehow, which typically requires exchanging some live feedback among the, the peers of the conversation. And we'll, uh, we'll share a few words about this later. Typically, it, it, it requires some messages being exchanged between the two parties. And of course, how you adapt can um, vary wildly because, for instance, browsers have access to the encoder and so can tweak things very easily. When you're working with an SFU, it's different because you don't encode things yourself. You're just relaying media coming from different places, and so you have less flexibility in what things you can do, but we'll see uh, how that can be solved anyway. Which means that the idea is doing something like this. Maybe you are sending something that is very high quality, the, the subscriber doesn't have uh, enough bandwidth to receive that, and so some, somehow you need to make sure that the, uh, that the, other, the other peer receives something meaningful, which can be done, again, by just re-encoding that stream, re uh, reducing the bitrate, or possibly playing with simulcast and SVC by sending a lower quality version of the same stream and then just switching between layers somehow. The idea is that bandwidth estimation should allow you to do both things depending on how you are actually encoding things. And it is, of course, not an easy problem to solve. There was a, a working group in the ITF called RMCAT that was specifically created to, to tailor exactly that. A few algorithms were discussed during that, uh, those efforts. Um, some, uh, the most known are Scream, NADA, and GCC, which stands for congestion, uh, Google Congestion Control. And uh, NADA was the main outcome of, the, of that working group. But if you look at it in practice, basically, uh, when you look at LibWebRTC, which is one of the, the things that basically all browsers use to actually implement WebRTC, uh, you see that they use GCC which typically leverages a specific uh, RTCP message for feedback, uh, which is documented there. And it basically uses a combined uh, usage of RTP extensions and RTP feedback. So for outgoing, for outgoing RTP packets, you put a label, and this label is then used in the feedback so that you know 
as a sender which packets were received, which were the interarrival delays and stuff like this. All information that is very useful for the algorithm to figure out the available bandwidth somehow. And I'll explain how I use that information for, for the same thing. Uh, which brings to, to Janus, of course. So uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you already know Janus or have heard of it? Okay, so <laughs> more people than I expected, which is really cool. So it's a WebRTC open source server, and you can find some links over there if you are not familiar with it. And of course, we are talking about doing things in a server rather than in a browser. So a few things change. As I mentioned, a browser generates media and so can fine tune the, the bit rate of the stream they're encoding. They can, they can encode the, the, the stream with a high, slightly higher bit rate over time to do some tweaking. With the server, you cannot do that. So you have to work with the streams that you are receiving. And so I started by having a look at how the existing congestion control algorithm works algorithms work, and the problem is that if you specifically look at GCC, there are drafts, there are papers, but they are very outdated. So what you find in documents is not what is actually implemented in browsers. And NADA itself, which again is the main outcome of ARM and CAT, is, is interesting, but is not usable at the moment because it does make use of a specific RTCP message that none of the browsers implement, so you cannot really consume that. There are ways to use the existing TWCC with NADA as well, but they are a bit of a hacks. The other problem is that when you start looking at how, the, how those algorithms work, this, this is, was basically my reaction. So there's a lot of complex math in there. I'm an engineer, so I should know, I should, I should I understand how all that works, but it is indeed complicated, sometimes overly complicated. And when you start asking around with other people that work in the WebRTC field, how uh, bandwidth estimation works, you typically get something like this. So you feel like you're in the Twin Peaks back, uh, Black Lodge, all very old reference. I see a lot of young people that may not even know what they are looking at right now. But basically, it is you're starting ask, you start asking questions and you get very cryptic responses uh, back. So it's very hard to figure out how bandwidth estimation works by just asking around. You have to do a lot of homework. And luckily, I mean, I have a lot of uh, smart uh, friends in the WebRTC world. I exchanged some, exchange some feedbacks with them, some, some discussions, and so on. And so I did figure out that, again, the first thing to, figure, to understand is that we are working in an SFU, which means working with existing media streams, for instance, simulcast layers that have different bitrate ranges that you can use to jump from one layer to the other to simulate increasing and lowering the quality. I also figured out that G G Google congestion control is not a common choice for a bandwidth estimation uh, algorithm for SFUs because, again, it's very poorly documented so, and also too complicated. So it's hard to basically figure out how to use it for the usage within a server. And besides, many of those that did try to do the same thing that I did discarded eventually GCC also because it didn't seem to fit well the requirements of an SFU rather than a complete endpoint that needs to work with, uh, with media. And so I decided to do something different. So I followed the advice of Sergio Garcia Murillo from Dolby, who did a similar thing. So he said, rather than using one of the algorithms, why better to try and come up with your own? So it may be less efficient than existing ones, but then it will be something that you know how it works, you know what to tweak, you know when uh, how to change some things here and there when things don't behave correctly, and which is what I eventually tried to do as well, by starting by some important key points. So these are the main important things to know when working with something like this. So you do need to start from acknowledged rate, and I'll go in detail about all of this in a second, but acknowledged rate is very important. You need to know how losses impact your, your, may impact your estimate. Even more important, you need to know how delays can impact this as well. And then you need to involve probing so that, uh, again, we don't have access to an encoder. So if we want to know whether or not we can send more than we can, and we have a static group of simulcast layers that always send pretty much an average amount of bit rate, if we want to know if we can jump from layer one to layer two, we need to inject some, dumb, uh, let's say, some generic traffic uh, in the middle that doesn't belong to the RTP traffic, but is just used to figure out if we can send more, basically. And the acknowledged rate is the very foundation of that because, and it is, uh, let's say, an, an imprecise, uh, let's say, a very rough estimate of source, but it is very important because, uh, again, I mentioned that with um, 
Uh, for instance, with GCC, you use uh, you put a label in RTP packets, and then you receive a, an RTCP feedback about those packets that you send. Which means that if you know how ma uh, which packets you sent, you know how large they were. When you receive feedback, you also have an idea of how many bytes the peer actually received. And th that is your acknowledged rate. So this is, this is the amount of data that the peer acknowledged they received, which means that you have an idea of how, ma how much data actually managed to get there, which is very important because it gives you a foundation. So uh, let's say, uh, at the very least, uh, a minimum of the estimate that you can use. And again, it's very rough because it depends on how much you send, not not really how much the channel allows you to send, but it is still quite important because, first of all, it, it gives you a number to start from. As soon as you start, you have an idea of where you can, where, what your estimate may be. And then when you encounter problems, maybe there's congestion and so on, you know that the acknowledged rate will, you can fall back to that for an estimate because at least that managed to get through and so that's a good value. Losses are, of course, important because the moment you, the peer tells you that they lost some packets, you may know that it may be related to, uh, to congestion and so that you may have to slow down. At the same time, it is a reactive mechanism, mechanism. so it means that you do something but only after a problem happened. And uh, this is, of course, something that can help but is not really that interesting, especially if you want to avoid things like video freezes, artifacts, or stuff like this. And besides, losses may not even be related to congestion. You may be on a Wi-Fi that always drops some packets uh, because it does, so and, and not really because of congestion. So you need to be aware of this in order not to overreact to, to many losses and not treat them as a symptom of congestion. But that said, there are different ways by which you can get info on losses, and it is still important to have at least an idea of the percentage of packets that you lost along the way. Much more important is working with delays instead, which is less intuitive, but also much more powerful. And in, in fact, it is at the basis of several of the algorithms that are out there. So for instance, in BBR, it's very much, uh, very much used. And the idea is that you start to analyze the inter-arrival delay patterns of packets, which is one of the info that we get back from feedback. So if we send some packets uh, that, are, that have some delay in between them, I send a packet now, a packet now, a packet now. And then for those packets, the peer tells me that they received the packets here, here, and here. I know that the, there is more delay in between those packets than the delay that I sent them at, which may be an indication of potential congestion, which means that it's a powerful tool to have because it means that you could actually anticipate congestion if done right. It means that somewhere over the network, there may be buffers that are filling up, which are slowly going to introduce delay which means that then the moment that you know you slow down and you send less in order to, to avoid that from happening. And of course, there's different problems here. So figuring out how to analyze this delay and what to use as a trigger for to say, oh, okay, I'm encountering a problem or not. And this, is, this was uh, very much a part of my, of my, tweaking, uh, my tweaking part. But the most important part is that we do have information on the raw delays in those feedback messages, which is uh, quite important. And of course, I'm just rushing through descriptions of all this because I don't have enough time to explain how it works specifically, but there is this uh, cool presentation from Matis from the Pion team who actually explains this very much in detail and shows, for instance, an example of packets that are arriving with more delay than they were sent at, as an idea. And for instance, if you look at the BBR specification as well, they also have an interesting graph that explains this more in practice, showing how loss-based things work more from the right and so are maybe too late, and you want to be as close as possible to that junction point over there in order to anticipate congestion instead. And finally, we have bandwidth probing, because so far we've only seen how we can go down, so how we can slow down because problems occurred, because there were losses or there were, there was, there were delays and so on, but we also want to know when we can go up because maybe we're sending less than we could. And since we don't have access to, encoder, to the encoder ourselves, we do know, uh, we do have a foundation because we have the acknowledged rates, but bandwidth probing helps with the going up part because we can just inject artificial packet, packets that are not the RTP traffic, so the audio and video that we're sending normally, but just traffic that we add that is part of the bandwidth estimation part though. So that uh, we start to, uh, to try and send more and more and more and more, and if we never encounter that problem of the delays going increasing, which may indicate congestion, it means that we can send more, 
at a certain point, we'll reach to a point where the estimate says, oh, okay, you can switch to this higher layer now. And okay, I'll, I'll do that and the quality will improve as a consequence. And again, bandwidth probing is another of the big mysteries of bandwidth estimation usually, because then you start asking yourself, uh, how do I do this? How do I do this? Uh, which packets do I send? How often do I send them? How much should I, should I send? And it's really a matter of experimentation. I personally use uh, retransmission packets for the purpose because they were easier to work with. But just to give you an idea, this is how it works from a graphical perspective. So if the dark blue line is your RTP traffic and you want to send more, you start sending some probing that is not the video traffic itself, everything is fine, you decide to start sending more RTP traffic and then you start sending more probing to see if you can send more and more. That's basically the idea. And so coming to how I used all of this in Janus, uh, first of all, I had to take into account that Janus is a modular component and has a particular architecture. Because uh, basically it has a WebRTC core that takes care of all the WebRTC stuff, but then all, how you handle all the media, what to do with the media, is all part of plugins that do not interact directly with the core. Which meant that I had to split a bit the, uh, the bandwidth est uh, estimation algorithm that I described before into uh, at least two different parts. So I had the Janus core handle all the, the feedback itself, monitor losses, delay, handle probing, that sort of things, and also come up with the estimate, of course. But then leave it up to the plugins to actually enforce the bandwidth estimate, because of course it's plugins that know what, what they want to do with the media. It's plugins that know if a user is using simulcast, for instance, how much uh, media a specific user is sending and stuff like this which meant adding some controls for plugins so that they can decide whether or not they want to use bandwidth estimation because, of course, it's, um, it's useless to use it unless you actually have a use for it. And most importantly, also to notify the target of the bitrate to the core so that we can implement probing as needed because the core can do probing, but it, it won't know how much to probe until the plugin tells them this is where I want to go. And there is a pull request that I created like 20 minutes ago or something like this just for you to access. And so, of course, there were a lot of efforts already. There were a lot of commits. There was a branch, but there was no pull request. So if you're interested in testing this, you can find more information there. And that's also where I'd like feedback to, to appear. And basically, in a nutshell, I created a new bandwidth estimation context in the peer connection object in Janus. Every time we send a packet, we keep track of it so that we know how it is, uh, what it is, how uh, its size, its delays, and so on. Anytime we receive a feedback, we reference those packets that we sent in order to accumulate, to create that acknowledged rate basis that I mentioned, monitor losses, inter arrival delays, and stuff, and update the current estimate. Once we have an estimate, we can involve plugins as well, and we have a loop that takes care of everything that needs to happen on a regular basis, including probing, for instance. So, Anytime a plugin notifies the Janus core that there is a specific target, we'll start probing on a regular basis, maybe stop when there is congestion, maybe stop when there is a change, these sort of things. And then, of course, we need to notify plugins about the current estimate so that they can do something about it. And the only plugin I started from is the SFU plugin, so the one that takes care of distributing uh, media streams, for instance, for conferencing purposes. And I kept it simple for now. So I decided to only work with a single simulcast video stream per peer connection. So you create a subscriber. If that subscription is for a simulcast stream, then the plugin tells the core to enable bandwidth estimation. We start keeping track of the published stream, so the video, the video that the user is subscribed to, so that we know the different profiles of the simulcast streams. We know that the highest quality is one megabit. If you use, if you use one less temporal layer, it's 800 kilobits, and then so on, so on, and so forth. And that gives you the different levels at which you can do the switching and gives you an idea of when you can switch depending on the, on the estimate. Which means that as soon as we do have an estimate, we can actually use that information for something. And I did make some tests with a single publisher and a single subscriber, of course with a subscriber getting video from a simulcast publisher and asking for the highest quality as possible. And then, of course, I in simulated some issues. So in simulating network constraints, I used Comcast as a tool on Linux, which is just a wrapper around PC and IP tables. So if you're familiar with those tools, you can do the same. And the outcome was quite interesting because, of course, it still doesn't work great because there is tweaking that needs, tweaking that needs to be done, but it does what it needs to do. So 
it goes down to, to, to a, a, the lower layer when there are issues. As soon as the, leaf, the, the issues disappear, it goes back where it should go. So it's definitely a good start, which uh, I appreciate it, but there is work to do. And I'm also keep, uh, basically saving statistics for all of that uh, in real time so that uh, I can graph everything that has happened so that I know how much I'm sending at any given time, how much I'm receiving at any given time, how much of that is RTP, how much of that is probing, what, which are the targets. These graphs are very useful when you want to figure out why things are not working as expected. And in this case, for instance, this is where I introduced the limitation and so why the, the estimate stayed at a lower level and why eventually I lifted the limitations and the estimate goes back up. And this is a graph of how I'm tracking when I'm going into a congested state, how I'm monitoring delays. And this is again very helpful because it can give you an idea of, from a graphical perspective, when the delays are telling you that there is congestion happening. So it's a really useful thing to have. And this is where I'm at, and of course there is work to do, because basically I created the testbed right now that allows me to play with bandwidth estimation, which is really cool. But there is a lot of fine-tuning that needs to happen to make it more stable than it currently is. There are some issues related to different browsers, because for instance, Firefox doesn't use the, the feedback stuff for audio, so it can be tricky if you want to, you, to handle both audio and video as part of your estimate. And more importantly, I need to make sure that the video room is much more smart than it currently is, because you could create a subscription where you want to receive 10 different simulcast streams, and then you need to know how to distribute the available estimate among all of them, maybe involve priorities, maybe use something different. It's, it's really complex. And this is really it, but before I, I'm done here, I want to, I'm, to make an important announcement for us, because JanusCon is the, our conference, and Basically, we, we did our first edition five years ago. We were excited. We said, we'll do it again next year. Then the pandemic started and it didn't happen. And so after five years, we are finally back. At the end of April, um, we'll do a new event around Janus and WebRTC. So if you're interested about it, we'll do it right in front of this beautiful castle on the sea. So it's definitely a nice place to be. And that's the link if you're interested in more information. There are some cool pictures, some cool information. So. Please join us if you want. And now I'm done, and also because I'm a bit late as well. So sorry about that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you for the talk. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, hi. Yeah, great, uh, great talk. Thanks, Ryan. So uh, I have a question. Uh, so initially, you said you went, you look at the uh, at the algorithms that were there. Um, could you like give us a, a, an example of how, like, what you mean uh, when you say they were overly complicated and over-engineered? And also, as you get into the rabbit hole, do you see your own um, algorithm getting more and more complicated and almost <laughs> getting there? I'll start from the last question. Yes, it, it does get slightly more complicated over time. The moment you start making some tweakings or start to uh, make it more complex the way that you do probing in order not to step on your own foot and cause congestion where it shouldn't happen, it does get a bit more complex after that, but in that case, it's a complexity that I'm more aware of because I started from scratch. I know how I got there, and so I know how to get back and take a different path. I didn't have the same luxury with uh, GCC because, for instance, just to make a very simple example, in GCC, to track delays and keep, to keep track of delays, they make use of a Kalman filter, which doesn't necessarily mean it's too complicated, but it's still a, very, a more complex algorithm that may be needed to actually track delays and, uh, and do things. And most of the over-engineering in, uh, in those algorithms comes from a lot of experimentation that Google did. So they had, they, they had uh, millions of, of deployments, so they had millions of use cases that they were working with, and so they fine-tuned it so much that eventually it gets very complicated very fast. But in that case, you end up looking at some very complex choices that you don't know how to work with. If you need to tweak something for your own uses, you don't know what to tweak because you don't know what box A does or what box B does. And the most, I mean, you could look at the specification where they may explain it, but then you have a look at it and it's a very outdated document and what is in the browser right now is completely different. So for instance, I know that, uh, I know there's people in this room that did use GCC as well. And so they may have had better luck with it in understanding it as well. But for me, when I tried to look at it, it was 
basically too overwhelming for me. And I really didn't know how I could fit this all within the Janus architecture, which is why I decided to just do something else instead. Thanks. Any other, any other questions? Yeah. Well, there is one. Um, so I wanted to ask about the uh, connection probing. What yeah. data do you use for connection probing? And what do you use when you start the communication? So uh, do you probe the connection when someone joins the, the room or you start with the highest possible resolution and see uh, what, what happens? Yeah, the, uh, the idea is that uh, for probing I'm using RTX. So I do have already packets ready for retransmissions because the, the subscriber may need to retransmit the packet using NAX and so on. So I already have those packets. And so what I do uh, is that on a regular basis, I just take a, a packet from our, the, RTX, uh, the RTX queue and then send multiple copies on it depending on how much I need to send for probing. And as soon as I start, I don't do any probing at all because uh, at least for the cup, first couple of seconds, I'm in an initial stage where I just observe things. And to just observe things, I just send whatever I can. And this is because the acknowledged rate is what matters to me at the very beginning. So I need to have a, a rough feeling of how much I can send right away. So if the, in this case, I was subscribing to the highest quality as possible and it worked, and so I was sending everything, if I, I was encountering issues right away, I would be in a case where right away the send and the acid be, uh, rates are not where they should be, which means that I encounter congestion and I soon need to, to go back to it. And this initial stage allows me to, give, to get the acknowledged rate as a basis and use that as, a, as an estimate. And after that, I decide when to do probing. And even deciding when to do probing is a different choice in of, uh, of itself because for, uh, for probing, I use a slowly increasing uh, curve because I don't want to start probing too much right away. If this is the target, I'll start, but I'll start slow and I'll try to get to the target slowly. Then as soon as I change simulcast layer, I stop probing because I'm there. And then even if they immediately tell me what the next level is, I don't do probing right away. I want to check if I'm stable where I am. And then after a few seconds, I can start probing. Anytime I get congestion, I stop probing and, and do a freeze period of a few seconds so that I don't do, I don't try to do any more probing until a few seconds pass to see if I can start doing things again. So there's really a lot to do to talk about probing and it's one of the things where I did fine tuning the most because it's one of the most delicate parts of the algorithm. Thank you. <laughs>